Thank you for listening to Season 1 of This Way Up. Please subscribe for our next adventure in space exploration first commercial company to land on the moon. I'm your host, Josh Marshall, and today we're talking to radio frequency engineer Michaela Landivar. She picks up the story where episode three left off. Our lander is on the moon, and the world is shouting, picks, or it didn't happen. I need my sleep, so I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So you had that much faith in the team that I'll sleep this one off and get ready for my next shift and just let them land and I'll nap through it. You were able to sleep through that? Yeah. I never underestimate my ability to sleep. That's impressive. <laughs> that That is actually impressive. <laughs> I remember we were getting ready for... Uh, for launch. And I'm like, Oh man, who's going to make this call of, uh, Oh, Hey, you know, we have, uh, we have contact with the vehicle. Who's going to make the call. And then someone said, Oh, it's Michaela. I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how to say her last name at all. And it made me really nervous, but then it got to the point where it came back and I just kept saying it because I'm like, Oh, it's familiar. And I know this last name now it's Landivar. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Where are you from? Um, I was born in Eureka, California, but I grew up in the College Station area in Texas. All right. Yeah. When did you, uh, when did you start here? Um, about two and a half years ago. Um, and I remember my first day very well. Uh, I met David Johnson. Uh, he's my boss and he like immediately I got here, he gave me a project to do and I just chugged at that and chugged at that and it was really awesome, um, just like meeting the people, working with different people here, um, just being able to like attack these various problems as they come up. I love it. Good. When did um, like did you always know like oh hey I'm gonna be on mission ops like I'll be in the arena when it matters the most? Um, I didn't initially like um, I met the previous like uh, com ops lead as um, I was onboarding. I was. Uh, I met her and then she kind of, I felt like interviewed me in her own way as she was leaving. Um, and was like, I felt like I, I think I got her kind of approval. And then, um, a few months later, uh, David, my boss approached me and was like, Hey, we need someone to do, um, like com ops. Would you be interested in doing that? And I have, I have a background in doing ops, um, at Johnson space center. And so I was like, sure, why not? I didn't know what I was getting into, but it sounded like there was a need and I wanted to contribute. So, yeah. What is a, what is con, a com ops? Yes. What is com ops? Com ops. Okay. So, um, basically we need a way to communicate with our spacecraft. Um, we have our different disciplines in our control room and com ops specifically refers to like the com consoles operations. So, and the com console is responsible for all of the traffic between the spacecraft and the ground. So whether it's like file operations or sending commands or like another one of our roles is making sure that like the comm engineering hardware is what it should be on the vehicle. Like we're going to be the first ones that notice if there's something that is off with the radios or um, anything like that. So you're responsible to make sure like we have a, a connection to the lander, right? Yep, yep. a good link basically. So what was it... Um like, how is it structured for you? I mean, we were, it took like a week to get to the moon. So, like, uh, how many shifts were you working on? And, like, how much time did that take up? Uh, what's the architecture look like for com ops, but the greater ops team and mission control? Okay. So, uh, from a high level for our ops in general, um, we broke the 24 hour day into three different shifts. Um, I did a white shift. We have a red shift and a blue shift as well. Um, call out to America. Um, and so uh, I took the first shift, which was launch day, which is what we were talking about earlier as far as like who's going to be the first person who like says that we have contact with the vehicle. So um, I did that and it was a nerve wracking few minutes there, just like waiting right after we separated. Um, but going back to the previous point, um, as far as the overall structure, we have our day broken down into different shifts. 
um, we have like a handover period between the different shifts. So the overall shift you're going to see is between nine to 10 hours. Um, and for transit, for the most part, like before we got to the moon, that was pretty steady. Um, once we got to the moon, uh, that was a suggestion. We'll put it that way. So uh, sometimes we had longer shifts, um, and they could be significantly longer just depending on what we were trying to do, um, what was going on at the time. So uh, what shift were you when, when we landed on the moon? Um, so I was, st I was still white shift. I wasn't one of the people who, uh, who landed specifically. So my understanding is that was um, like blue shift and going into red shift. So what I recall happening was um, blue shift announced the landing. And then um, we had a period where we didn't know uh, what the status of the vehicle was because we weren't like really hearing and getting any data from it. Um, and then a little while later on red shift, the next shift after um, blue shift, uh, we started getting data and like hearing from the lander. Um, and then on my shift, um, we started to get like a really, a much stronger signal. So that first shift, like my first shift after landing, um, we were just like kind of trying to get like a status of the situation. Like why were we seeing the, um, the signal like patterns that we were seeing as like they weren't what we expected. Um, like, Tim mentioned that he said, uh, you know, landed on the moon. We got, got communications. Weren't getting telemetry started to get that. What was, what was like the situation? Were you part of triaging what was happening? So, um, my part when we came on shift was, like my job as a comm operator is to make sure that we have a good link with like, like we talked about. So as a, as a group, if we're not getting data, I can't decide, you know, are the radios well, or are they, are they healthy? Um, so then the question becomes, well, why aren't we getting data? Um, and so we started to kind of think about like, did we land in a weird way, like were we not upright, were we not like, were we tilted over? Um, so that was what was kind of going on in the control room during my shift. We were trying to figure out, um, were we facing the wrong direction? Were we tilted over? Which direction were we tilted over? Where was the earth with respect to the different um, antennas? So we have um, five different antennas on IM-1. And um, like we were hoping that you know, maybe three of them ish were pointed in the general direction of Earth. Um, that would be the hope. Uh, from the responses that we were seeing, that wasn't the case. And we we're trying to figure out, okay, well, if that's not the case, then which antennas are pointed in the general direction of Earth? Like, how exactly did we tip with respect to everything else? So, on Earth, you know, it seems pretty straightforward, right? You always have your know, radio in your car, you have satellite radio you know, different bands on Earth that give us radio. Why is it so different at the moon? I mean, we had, we have four antennas that we're all trying to get back. And like, what was so difficult about just sending back a simple picture? Um, well, let me tell you about the original plan. And then maybe I'll tell you about like where we were with respect to the original plan. And then I'll you'll maybe we'll be able to see why it was a lot more difficult than, than we'd expected. So the original plan was, like I said, we'd have about maybe three antennas pointed toward Earth. Um, for our spacecraft, we have two different types of antennas. We have um, like a high gain antenna, which is um, what we use for like our high data rate and like would be for bringing down like large amounts of information essentially um, at like high speeds. And then we have our hemi antennas. Um, our hemi antennas are... Um, they have a much wider beam width, and so um, they don't have to be pointed as directionally. Our high gain antenna has a much narrower beam width, so it has to be pointed at its target or it's gonna miss. You're, you're just not gonna get the information. So our Hemis, um, they're wider, but they're not as powerful. They're, they're, our beam width is wider, but not as powerful. Our um, high gain antenna, narrower beam width, but much more powerful. So, the way we'd set everything up and plan to run everything was we're going to have our high gain antenna pointed at Earth. We're going to like start blasting down like large amounts of data and we're going to get our picture. We're going to get our files, everything we wanted. We found out that we were tipped over in a particular way and 
we didn't have our high gain pointed at Earth. We had our hemis that we could use, and we had to figure out how to like basically reroute. Um, uh, and it's not something that we did on the fly. It was an option that we could always choose, but reroute which radio was going to our hemis as opposed to our high gain. So we have two different types of radios on the lander. Um, one is a high data rate radio, which is where we're going to chug that information down to earth. And then the other ones we use for like our telemetry and our commanding and stuff like that, or receiving commands from earth. Um, so what we did originally for the first few days after landing was just try and get our sea legs, so to speak. Um, we were trying to figure out what the situation was, like how it was different than what we'd expected, like why we couldn't use the high gain. So we're, til we're tipped over. It's not pointed in the right direction, that sort of thing. The high gain isn't pointed in the right direction. Um, which hemi antennas were actually pointed in the right direction that we could actually use. Um, and so for the first few days, we did that. And then we also experienced different difficulties like during the first few days. So like we had some of our partners, um, ground stations equipment failed. Um, we had um, weather issues at various ground stations, like rains or high winds, um, um, rains and lightning strikes and stuff like that. So we had a lot of different things that were trying to keep us essentially from getting this data down and getting the picture that we wanted to just be like, hey, we've come all the way from Earth to the moon we want a picture of it. We want to see what happened. We want to see everything about it, everything we can. Um, so you would think it would be just this easy thing, right? You know, you guys just conquered traveling to the moon. You've landed on the moon. You have radio signal from the moon. We'll just prove it and send a picture. Yes. Right. There was only you know the world asking for it. Yeah, I think my inbox was was going off like a pinball machine while you were trying to sort out this problem. Yes, and and so. Like we, we spent like, I think the first three days and we got an image, I think on the third day, but it wasn't a good image. And so we were looking for that, like, okay, this is the one type we can show this to the world. We did this and we're there, um, image. And so I think it was, it was definitely after the third day. I don't know if it was the fourth or the fifth, um, like we started to not just get our sea legs, but to kind of get acclimated to what was being thrown at us and we were like okay um like our leadership started to basically run an experiment like okay well we have all of these different patterns or uh, combinations of antennas and radios that we can pair up um let's run through them and see which one gives us the strongest signal and so they spent an entire shift at one of like run of red shifts, just going through all of the different, we call them comm configs, all the different comm configs, which are pairings between antennas and radios. Right. And you said it was two radios and four antennas. So we have two different types of radios, but there are actually four total radios on the lander. Okay. But yeah, two different types of radios and then five different antennas. Um, and there's two different types of antennas, but there's five total antennas. Um, so they did an experiment and they figured out which comm config would actually give us the strongest signal. And so red shift was the shift right before white shift. So white shift actually had, um, we have just by the way the timing worked out, we had parks as our ground station and parks is a huge dish. It's one of the biggest dishes or is the biggest dish in our um, our partnership of, of ground stations. And that was the main dish that we were seeing the best signal on because it's so big and could hear pretty much everything. Just giant ear. Right. Um, Shout out down under to, mm -hmm. uh, to Australia for providing that. <laughs> yes. To parks, go parks. Um, and they were, they were awesome. Like the entire mission, they're just great people to work with too. Um, so, uh, when we rolled around to parks, we also were partnering with the uh, DSN at this point in time. So we had it's NASA's Deep Space Network. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we had two different ground stations that we were um, using for their uplink capabilities. So um, they had much better. Well, parks is a great ear, but it has no mouth. So it cannot speak, essentially. It's just a little listener, it has no transmitter. Um, 
so we were using the DSN ground stations for transmission purposes, and then we were hearing our downlink on the uh, uh, parks ground station. And so um, that day, we got in so much data. Like after we figured out which comm config to be on, the only thing that we had really, we were fighting a few things still, but not, not everything else like we were before, just figuring out like which antennas or what to do or anything like that. So we were fighting multipath, which um, is basically like, for example, if you're in an echoey room and you shout, the echoes that you're hearing are like the different paths that the sound is coming from. Like they're not all going in one, like in one path in one direction. So you can get like a signal on the moon reflected off the ground and it's gonna go maybe like reflect off different rocks that are around and it's not gonna take all take the same path. So you're gonna get either uh, waves that are gonna like run into each other and destructively interfere. So they're gonna cancel your, your signal out or like lower the signal level, the strength of it, or they can like add to your signal level if they like um, constructively interfere. And so you could actually get a boost. But I mean, what we were seeing was actually variable at the moon. So like, we would see periods where we would get like a really strong signal and then it would start to diminish. And then like we would actually lose signal and we'd have periods where we wouldn't be hearing anything from the moon. And then it would start to build back up and it would just keep on this cycle of like doing that. And that was what we were attributing to multipath effects. Um, so we were dealing with that. And then we were also dealing with um, like Sometimes when you're, you know, not necessarily landed in the configuration that you wanted to or as nicely as you wanted to, you have things happen that you have to work around. And so we actually um, had to come up with different ways to get files down um, and like to get the large amounts of data down that we wanted to without using our, um, our high gain antenna and without using our highest data rates. So we were fighting or like we were using our ingenuity to kind of use our own lander system as um, intelligently as we could to get what we needed to get down. What do you remember about trying to get down? Like that first picture came through and uh, I mean, it, it just looked like someone slapped some paint on a wall. It just had a bunch of those little dots on there. You remember the one I'm talking about? It's got uh, it was it was really bad resolution. So honestly, like I was thinking about this um, yesterday as I was like thinking over mission in general and like what I wanted to say. And I was thinking about how people often describe a fight or describe like a war. Like no one remembers anything that happened punch for punch or like what happened sequentially. Honestly, like in that time period, like while we were on console, we were just going and it was like okay like as a comm operator like people are sending um uh basically requests for me to bring data down from like specific directories on the lander and like you get so in the zone of okay this one's the next one this one's the next one okay no we're not doing that one because we're going to run out of time or this is happening and i need to like mitigate this problem really fast before i can do the next thing or this command needs to go up because we're overheating um a payload is overheating and we need to like bring the temperature down a little bit so the heater needs to be turned off or something like that so it's just like one thing nonstop after another so as the data was coming down as like pictures were coming down for me specifically I don't know about the other comm operators they would have to speak for for themselves but it was less about oh yeah we just got this great picture and it looks fabulous or it looks in the first case of the first picture it looks kind of not great um like it was less we didn't get to celebrate right then like I didn't see the full gamut of like all of the pictures that we brought down until I think maybe like the week after mission ended and I saw it like a flip book and I was just like, like we did that. Like that was when it really actually hit me was when I saw that and like saw pictures from like launch, like transit, landing, and then like all of 
all of that strung together like a flip book. And it was, it was amazing. It's one of like, I will never forget that moment in my life. That was amazing to watch or to see. Where were you when, uh, when we landed? Certainly you weren't taking a nap between shifts, right? Um, I was actually because the, when we landed was later than expected. And so, um, in order to be ready for the next shift, like I needed to sleep. I'm sorry. I got to sleep, but I did actually wake up because the, the time that we were going to land actually shifted a little bit. And so, um, I wanted to hear what was going on. So I kind of tuned in and was like checking to see when, you know, when it was going to happen. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. I need my sleep. So I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So you had that much faith in the team that I'll sleep this one off and get ready for my next shift and just let them land and I'll nap through it. You were able to sleep through that? Yeah. I never underestimate my ability to sleep. That's impressive. <laughs> that That is actually impressive. But it was needed, right? What was the, you know, you worked through the weekend to solve, you know, the, the multipath issue. Um, what did you kind of learn? What was like the final solution? I mean, were we beaming directly at the lander? It just happened to be not upright. So, like, there were a few different problems. Like, there was an uplink problem, potentially, that developed later, um, well, kind of later. Um, so, some of our ground stations have more powerful transmitters than others. Um, like, Parks, for example, doesn't even have a transmitter, so, like, that we use for our mission. So, um, we found, because of the way that we had tilted as well, that we needed more power than expected to get to our antennas for the, for the signal to get to our antennas. So part of that was, was finding that out, um, over the course of that week. And then additionally, like we were talking about was the, the other side, which was the downlink problem, which we, we, we touched on a little bit, which we did the experiment and we found out which comm config would help us like actually, excuse me, get the data down, um, uh, back to earth. Um, so it was, it was, was it bouncing off the surface in order to get the best the the best data down to send those images and other science data? So, multipath is essentially bouncing off the surface. There is like for IM one because we don't have like articulatable antennas. Um, we have no recourse as far as multipath is concerned. And then additionally, because of the way that we were tilted and the angles that our antennas were with respect to the surface. We were, we were going to see multipath. There was no way we weren't going to. So it, it wasn't so much a, a problem to solve for multipath specifically. It was, it was, oh my gosh, we figured out ways around it. We figured out which antennas to use on the lander for downlink. Um, and then we figured out um, like what transmit power we needed on the earth side from our ground stations in order to actually have our signal received at the lander. So... I think those were two of the problems. Um, some of the other problems that we faced were more like um, because we have like images of such high, uh, either high resolution or like we want to get so much like actual amounts of data down, we had to come up with creative ways to um, make that data basically bring down less data, but still get a cool image. So decimate the images right. as, as we needed to, um, or like compress them in some way or something like that. So, cause uh, the camera, the camera kind of gets lost. The, the cameras that are on the lander, you know, are, are just tiny, right? So they take their pictures and they store it on the camera. And then you have to, you have to send the commands to go in and look at all the thumbnails of, nope, this one's completely dark, this one's might be correct, and then you have to send another one to go in and select that and choose to download it as, eh, okay, resolution, or it might take 20 minutes to get down this one image, yeah. right? Yeah. It's it's a lot. And the first ones after you solve the, the comms problem uh, were images that were from descent and not after landing. And everyone's just waiting, waiting, waiting of like, oh, you say you landed on the moon. We waited a long time. Like, prove it with a picture. And it took days to, to yes. find that one and, and working with the, the payload integration managers to reprogram the camera that eventually got that picture 
of the surface from the surface when it didn't happen for days. Yes, that is, yes. <laughs> what um, what was your interaction with with getting that final one of like finally it's it's proof, right? This is our we this is exactly the way the lander is laying, and this is the image. Um, as far as interaction, like again, it was one thing after another so it was it was looking for a needle in a haystack honestly like you were saying the whole process of actually finding the image that we were looking for was was a, a huge team effort like it, it definitely like it was not me pushing the buttons to bring this down and I know which exactly one like which exact one we need or anything like that it was like um each different team member or console was like looking through like their own payloads or payloads that they knew were responsible for to make sure that they had any information that could contribute to like which image would actually be the right image that we were looking for. So, I mean, it was a huge team effort. The, the control room was pretty much nonstop talking once we finally got those problems like mitigated on like the third ish day as far as being able to have pretty reliable uplink and downlink um for that period over parks um so like people would be talking nonstop. i would be they would be sending me commands to like offload the image from the camera and then like right after that someone else would take that as soon as it came down and start to like um i believe decompressing it to start and like taking a look at what it actually looked like and then they'd be like, okay, well, we were going to downlink this thing. We decided based on the last image or whatever that we got, the thumbnail that we got, we're not going to do that. We're going to flip this other one out. So, I mean, it was, it was nonstop action. Um, there wasn't really a time to like sit there and be like, this is really cool. Or um, like, we just got this image that we were looking for, this final image. Like, I think... I think one of the times I saw the actual image in the control room, and that was when GroundNet pulled up, and I don't even remember which image this was actually, but they pulled up an image on their console that we'd just gotten down, and I was like, oh my gosh, we got one. Like, we got one. Um, but as far as, like, the roles of the operators, and specifically for COM, like, because it's always going to be okay, what command are we sending next or what file operation command are we doing next? There was not a time to be like, we got the file, let's like celebrate. Um, Why was it such a rush? And like, what, what does it sound like? What are they telling you to, to do or like sending you a post-it note? And what was, what was the rush of why well, I can't sit there and, oh, there's a beautiful uncompressed image of us on the surface of the moon? Well, um, I think... The rush was a few different factors. Um, there, like, we didn't design this vehicle to withstand lunar night, for one. Um, and so there was always a time limit, you know. So, I mean, there was a potential chance that maybe we would survive lunar night, but it was low, so we'd expected it. Um, so that means the hard cutoff was when lunar night was going to hit. And so that means we can get whatever data we get in that finite amount of time and then that's it until our next mission. And so that was the one thing was like, there's that cutoff right there. And then the other thing was um, because we landed in a sort of tilted position, there was always, well, okay, are we going to have like the ability to communicate for the next day? Like, are we going to have signal? Or are we not going to have signal? So we wanted to make sure that we were being on top of everything and making sure that we got all of the data that we could. So it was definitely a drive to get every last drop and make every minute count that we had before lunar night. How much time were you getting when, you know, the dishes aligned and how much opportunity window did that afford of, hey, you know, we have 24 hours in a day. But it doesn't mean 24-7 we're trying to upload and download from the moon, right? Yeah. How, what, how, long, how long of a shot did you get? So because of um, the distances and the way that we landed and how it affected our signal strength, um, 
typically parks, Goonhilly, and um, D32 in India. These are all names of big radio astronomy dishes on Earth. Yes. Right. Those ground stations were the ones that we could either like hear on or like transmit. So like D32 and Goonhilly are 32 meter dishes and um, Parks is a 64. So we actually got like Parks being 64, that was the longest stretch of the day where we would get solid downlink. And so that's why we would pair it with like some transmitters from the DSN, pair Parks with those transmitters so we could get uplink on those transmitters and then downlink on Parks. And that would be like several hours usually. Um, but it wasn't anywhere near 24 hours. So then the next, like the next large portion of the day that would have a dish that would cover it, um, would be like Goonhilly. And then, so Goonhilly, um, we were seeing, we could get signal, uh, like we could get uplink going and send commands and stuff, but it was kind of more spotty on the surface. Um, and so, uh, and then same thing with the downlink, we were, we would see bursts of activity, but the really good stretches where we would have like maybe a few hours that a go would be at parks. And then that was complicated in itself due to weather, because being such a large dish, then parks would sometimes, um, get I think there was popped. a, there was a hurricane or some kind of storm. Yeah. Yeah. So like for, for parks, at least it was, it was. It's their windy season. So um, basically, I think that goes from like November to like January is what I believe they told us. And so like in looking over like the console logs, pretty much every single day, the wind speeds would get so high that we would have to actually, they would automatically, the system automatically just parks and stows the dish so that it won't be damaged by the winds. So we got used to hearing like these like squawking sounds coming over our loops that originally like I thought was some weird Australian bird. And then I realized they were like klaxon sounds or whatever. And like it would just no notify us like before they even said anything like on the loops that they were wind parked and we were not we were going to have to wait until the winds died down to a certain level. And then we would actually be able to like start tracking again. So. That happened, as far as I can tell, like from the logs, like pretty much consistently for some duration of time, like every single day we were on the moon. Um, there were some days where it was pretty much just like all wind parked. Um, and we were just sitting there like waiting, like on pins and needles to be like, when is it gonna like die down? When are we gonna be able to send, like hear something, see the next thing, do the next thing? And sometimes we would send commands in the blind. So basically we would have uplink available. And if we needed to like send a command to the spacecraft to maybe turn something off or um, switch a config, like a, a comm config, like the antenna configs I was talking about before, um, we would use that uplink capability, but we would get no downlink because we were wind parked um, and we would have no confirmation of it until later. But it was still useful to be able to send the commands via uplink. It was just very um the feeling was like very alive like we finally accomplished this goal that we'd been working toward for years some of us um and like we'd gotten what we wanted we'd gotten the images we'd gotten the data that we'd looked for our payloads had gotten the data that they needed um it was just a really great time to just bond with people that you've been working so hard with and just like celebrate um, and kind of just goof off and like shoot Nerf guns or play games or whatever. So, um, just really great time all around. And now we're, you know, halfway through the year, which means it's just time to do it again. Are you looking, yes. you looking forward to it? Yes. Um, it's, it's, I think, I think just after mission, like the few months after mission, it wasn't quite real. Um, we were still in a lot of cases, um, like in kind of recovering in a way because, like I was saying, like, it's an amazing thing, but it takes, like, it takes effort. It takes strength. It takes, um, like, some people were up more than 24 hours a day and, like, just kept on chugging and stuff like that. And I know they were the ones who, like, had probably the hardest toll, like, taken, and they just needed some rest. And so we took that time, I think, to 
kind of rest and recuperate. And then right now, or not right now, but like right after that, like there's the turnaround of, okay, well, we're doing this again this year and we need to have everything ready. We need to have our ops ready. So like how our operations in the control room are going to look like that needs to be reviewed again. And like, we're moving towards that as like, as the comm operations lead. Um, one of the things that we're doing is like looking through all of our procedures to make sure that we update all of the things that we need to update for the new mission. Or like we had, um, some people, um, who wanted to do like different console positions. And so like, I have, um, like three new people who are going to be, uh, performing the link console operations now. And so they have to be trained. Um, we got a lot of lessons learned out of like how we did ground station handovers for IM one from like our different ground stations. And then just like what we learned in like ourselves. So it's like implementing those lessons learned as well into the, like the new procedures that we're going to write or like modifying the existing procedures that we have. So a lot of it is, I mean, that's only like the operations aspect. There's like work that needs to be done to like analyze the mission, which we also did like just a few months after mission while we were recuperating, we were still like, it wasn't like, oh, we took a month off and like as a company and, and just kind of slept. It wasn't like Maybe that. just work like 40 hours a week instead of 80. Something just like Just for a little that. while. Something yeah. like that. And then, <laughs> so while we're working those like 40 hours a week, like doing an analysis of like what went wrong or maybe didn't go as planned for IM1 and how we want to make sure we can make it go better on IM2. So like I worked with one of the other um, comm operators um, on an analysis of like why we didn't have like continuous calm over transit, like the, the path to the moon phase. Um, so we could decide what we wanted to do for our calm system moving forward on IM2. So there was just, there's a lot going on. There was a lot going on. There will be a lot going on. Um, as That's just the way forward. it is. Yeah. That's the name of the game. Yeah. And it, it doesn't let up. And I think like, I think that's one of the things that a lot of the people who work at intuitive machines actually like kind of thrive on is you don't know what's going to necessarily happen in your day. You know that it's going to be amazing and crazy and like you're going to need to like really fight to figure out like the problems that you're facing and figure them out. And like, if you really love to do that, if you really like to have many diverse things going on in your day or your week or whatever that just kind of never let up, then you're just, you would love it here. So, yeah, and that's why I love it here. There's always something new going on and something different. I love that. Well, y'all did an amazing job and uh, appreciate you taking some time. Join us on the pod. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to season one of This Way Up please subscribe for our next adventure in space exploration.